<clears throat> My name is Stefano Trevisan. I'm a member of Community Board 5 and one of the organizers of this event. And thank you so much for coming, and thank you to those of you joining us by live stream. I'd like to thank our co-sponsor for this evening, the Regional Plan Association, and in particular, Pirina Ana Sanchez and Christine Shu, as well as Brian Dorsey from the Practice for Architecture and Urbanism. I'd also like to thank Joe Saito and the sag After Foundation for generously allowing us to use their spectacular new space. And of course, I'd like to thank our participants, Tom Wright, the president of the Regional Plan Association, <clears throat> Vishan Chakrabarty, the founder of the Practice for Architecture and Urbanism, and Michael Kimmelman, the architecture critic for the New York Times. We're honored that they agreed to join us tonight, but we want to thank them most of all for doing the extraordinarily important work of bringing this issue to the forefront where it belongs. <clears throat> the idea for this event was formulated when we at CB5 found ourselves attempting to respond to a number of hugely impactful developments in our district. A number of years ago, we were called to meetings about Amtrak's daunting new gateway project, which would, among other things, create two new train tunnels under the Hudson River, and in a later phase, build an extension of Penn Station, taking up an entire New York City block. Likewise, for years, we've heard from the Port Authority about the need for a new bus terminal to replace the current unsightly 70-year-old facility, which has long been over capacity. At the same time, we've been part of the discussions around the planned transformation of the Farley Building, known, now known as Moynihan Station. And at the center of it all, four years ago, Community Board 5 was the first to call for limiting Madison Square Garden to only a 10-year renewal of its special permit to operate over Penn Station. So that after 60 years of a notoriously cramped and crowded underground existence, Penn Station could once again become a beacon for our city and for the 650,000 people who endure it on a daily basis. All of these projects fall either within our district or are immediately across the street. And yet, coordinated planning for these clearly interconnected transportation projects between and among the organizations responsible for them was nowhere to be found. We attended meetings with Empire State Development Corporation to discuss Moynihan, with Amtrak to discuss Gateway, with the Port Authority to discuss the new bus terminal, and frankly, anyone we could about the need to move MSG and build a new Penn Station. But none of these agencies seem to talk to or coordinate with each other. We at CB5 firmly believe that if our goal is to plan for and create a better New York by doing all that is necessary for the region to succeed economically, in the decades to come, it is imperative for the city, state, and federal government to communicate. There needs to be a constant flow of information and ideas between and among them. And most of all, we need the political will and leadership to get these projects accomplished in the best, most timely, and coordinated way possible. So naturally, we were thrilled to see Michael Kimmelman's piece in the New York Times, which, coupled with the subsequent Times editorial, shone a spotlight on a bold and creative new vision for Vishan Chakrabarty for a new Penn Station. The RPA, led by Tom Wright, has been active in advocating for a more enlightened way of thinking about our region's transportation infrastructure, particularly around rail. So we decided to join with them to spread the word and help make a dignified Penn Station as part of a new West Midtown Transit Corridor, a proud gateway of our city. Now our hope is that each of you will walk away tonight ready to do your part to help make these plans come to fruition. Because if this election has taught us anything, it's that if there's something you want to see changed, you need to stand up and fight for it. And with that introduction, I'd like to give you all a brief rundown of how the night will proceed. We'll start with an overview of what's at stake by Tom Wright. Then Vishan will present his specific proposals around moving MSG and his vision for Penn Station. We'll follow that up with a panel discussion moderated by Michael Kimmelman. And finally, we'd like to give you, our audience, an opportunity to participate by asking questions. If you have a question, write it down on the cards that you've been given. And after Vishan's presentation, we'll collect all the cards and at the end of the panel discussion, we'll take a few moments to hopefully get some of those questions answered. So let me now introduce our first speaker. He's the president of the Regional Plan Association, an independent think tank focused on urban planning in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut metropolitan region. 
He has worked on several important initiatives, including the campaign to create a mixed-use district at Hudson Yards, the protection of the New Jersey Highlands, and a vision for the revitalization of Newark. Before joining RPA in 2001, he was the Deputy Executive Director of the New Jersey Office of State Planning and the coordinator of the Mayor's Institute on City Design, sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. He is also a visiting lecturer at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Please welcome Tom Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that very kind introduction. Is this on? It is? Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening and talk about this topic, uh, which is near and dear to uh, our hearts at RPA, Community Board 5s, and so many people uh, in New York City and the region. I think uh, the interest in this is really kind of demonstrates, I think, how much the public wants to know about what's going on and, um, and see these plans improve. Uh, my job here to kind of lay this out is to give you a little bit of a sense of the regional context, maybe try to provide an overview of the way we're looking at the region, trans-Hudson capacity issues, both at the um, both buses and rail, um, and maybe point to some of the issues that we're thinking about before I turn it over uh, to Vishan to share uh, his brilliant proposal. Um, let's see if I can do this one here. I'll do it this way. There we go. Uh, this is an image, actually, that the Port Authority created um, as part of the, the planning for the bus terminal. And I think it's a kind of wonderful uh, graphic that gives you a sense of the complexity and interconnectivity of the New York metropolitan region. This shows the location of commuters coming into Manhattan uh, and the modes that they're using to get there. Um, and what you see is this kind of, is of course that uh, geography is to a certain degree destiny and infrastructure is destiny too. Uh, and so that the uh, folks living in, in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx with their wonderful subway service and even parts of New Jersey uh, rely heavily on that. Um, rail service in the, uh, in, in the dark blue kind of extending out onto Long Island, uh, uh, Westchester and Connecticut uh, where Metro North is and then pockets of New Jersey, where, you, where New Jersey Transit has good coverage. Um, quite a lot of people driving in, especially from the western shore of the Hudson River uh, and northern Staten Island. Uh, and then the bus service, which is really kind of spread throughout, but mostly coming from the west again. Um, it's kind of understanding where folks are coming from and where they're going to is one of the central elements that we've got to keep our minds on as we think about the future and where we should be investing and growing and building. Um, so, so this is kind of, I think, a very important image to start with. Another thing just to kind of understand when you think about the region is how there's this enormous imbalance in the number of crossings into Manhattan depending on the direction you're coming from. Uh, that there are 15 Harlem River crossings, 18 East River crossings, and only six across the Hudson River. Uh, that New Jersey has always been kind of a poor, uh, has always had very poor access uh, relative to the north and the east. Um, of those six, though, realize that while cars are driving across the GW Bridge, Lincoln, and Holland Tunnels, uh, there's transit on virtually five of them, with the Lincoln Tunnel also providing the bus service, uh, the two path uh, connections, and of course the Northeast Corridor. Um, so when we kind of talk about specifically how do people get across the Hudson River, uh, currently, this is, a, this is a kind of based on a 2013 weekday inbound uh, trips, um, what you see first of all is how buses serve an enormous number of the riders coming into Manhattan from the west. 43% uh, of the trips across the Hudson River uh, to Midtown are, are, are on bus. Um, New Jersey Transit and Amtrak, those are the, the, the trains into Penn Station. Just about uh, uh, one out of every five trips are coming in that way. PATH also really emerges, you can see, as a kind of important piece of the puzzle. Uh, and, and going downtown, but also really the PATH up, up, Uptown Station at 33rd Street with even more ridership than those going currently to the World Trade Center. Of course, we would expect to see the World Trade Center numbers increase as we lease up and fill up the uh, redevelopment of the World Trade Center site. The sign, I'm so, sure. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> here's another thing just to understand when you think about the future and kind of where people are coming from. This slide shows the net new commuters into Manhattan over a 20-year period from 1990 to 2010. Over that period of time, Long Island was essentially flat. Today, virtually the same number of people are commuting into Long, from Long Island into Manhattan as there were 20, 25 years ago. Connecticut has seen a 5,000 uh, daily increase in commuters into the city. The biggest change in Connecticut is actually the reverse commute. More people are now living in Manhattan and commuting to jobs out in Greenwich or even Stanford. Hudson Valley has seen 8,000 additional people come in. But the bulk of new commuters coming into Manhattan over this 20-year period of time were coming from west of the Hudson River. Why was this the case? Well, there was capacity there. New Jersey Transit did projects like Midtown Direct Service, the Secaucus Transfer, uh, the Montclair Connection. New Jersey also put in place policies to encourage more residential multifamily uh, development around their train stations. And so New Jersey saw the benefit of this. So almost 90%, about 85% or so, of net new commuters into Manhattan over this period of time came from west of the Hudson River. When you think about the development, say, of a new business district at the Hudson Yards or other places, a certain portion of the people who are going to work in that area are going to be walking to work, we hope, living in the area, or coming from within the five boroughs. But to the degree that they're not, many of them will probably want to come from New Jersey. Long Island should start to see this change with, in a couple of years, the opening of East Side Access, which will give commuters new one-seat rides to East Midtown. But frankly, unless we're successful in also getting the third track built on the main line of the Long Island Railroad, and unless the communities in Long Island start to allow for multifamily and rental housing, it'll be really hard to kind of see the full benefit of all of this. Um, the other trend I kind of want people to understand is that New York City is now growing much faster than the rest of the region. Uh, this chart goes back to 2003 and kind of setting at zero the number of jobs in each of in New York City and northern New Jersey, Long Island, Hudson Valley, and southwestern Connecticut. What you see is that New York, I, from where I am, the colors are hard to see. I hope they're easier for you. But the top line is New York City employment. We were on a robust period of growth. We had a slight dip from the recession of 2008. Those of us who remember the early 90s lived through a much deeper and more severe and slower recovering recession uh, than the Great Recession. And New York City has been off and galloping again since then, whereas Connecticut and New Jersey are just barely getting back to the employment that they had uh, uh, back in 2003 and we're still seeing slow in, uh, employment growth in the Hudson Valley and Long Island, too. In fact, just to kind of put an even finer point on it, uh, when I was growing up in the late 60s and early 70s in New York and in New Jersey, uh, job growth in this region for that period of time, over that entire generation, essentially for every 10 jobs created in the tri-state metropolitan area that we think about at RPA, nine of them were outside New York City, and one of them roughly was inside the five boroughs of the city. What was happening, jobs were being created in northern New Jersey especially, also Westchester, Fairfield County, places like that. That, that trend followed for a good long period of time. And, and I think for many people, we kind of assumed that the future would always be suburbanization. In fact, over the last 10 years, not only did New York catch up with the rest of the region, but it now gets 90% of the new job growth. Nine out of every 10 new jobs created in the tri-state region over the last decade have been inside the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, we would like to see places like Newark and White Plains and Bridgeport get more job growth, but we also have to understand that the kind of industries that are growing tend to want to be located in the city. The fastest growing parts of, uh, of the city economically are Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and that we have to be able to kind of understand this dynamic. People are going to want to continue uh, to get to jobs in New York City. So as we kind of look out to the future, and these numbers will probably change. These were early estimates. Um, but just kind of running some numbers about what kind of potential growth we could experience over the next 25 years, we anticipate the need to see, you know, roughly another 50,000 plus or minus coming from the Hudson Valley and Long Island. Less growth from Connecticut. Connecticut's got a lot of structural issues to take care of, but easily 100,000 people coming across the Hudson River over the next 25 years, only if we have the capacity to move them. 
So that becomes the kind of challenge to us. Um, now, today, how are people getting across the river? An enormous number of them are coming uh, on buses. I, I think, again, it's very easy to kind of miss the importance of the bus network to the overall transportation network here. Uh, and of course, this benefits both sides of the river. At RPA, we don't kind of look at this as a, you know, you win or it's your investment or my investment kind of thing. Uh, those are good paying jobs for people in New Jersey, uh, bringing money home to their communities, and they benefit from the proximity to New York. And New York City does not exist without the access to that workforce that it gets through this transportation network either. So both sides um, experience this. But you also see that the number of bus riders coming into the CBD, it's deeply unbalanced, uh, that we're very heavily dependent, especially across the Hudson River. Um, as everybody here knows very well, the Port Authority bus terminal is essentially a failing facility, one that is overcrowded, uh, outmoded, uh, structurally unsound at some point. And so changes in investment and, and kind of a redevelopment of that is going to be absolutely necessary and something that has to move forward. And again, I just want to emphasize, this is not just a New York project or a New Jersey project. This is a regional priority and something that the entire region has to be focused on. The thing is, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, and I think as, as folks who live in this neighborhood know, figuring out where the bus terminal should go, how it will connect to transit, um, what size it should be, those are very complicated, important questions. I feel a little bit right now, like the Port Authority kind of, they control the building and the tunnel that goes into it. But think about it. They don't actually run the buses themselves. That's New Jersey Transit. They don't control the transit network that most of the riders connect to. That's the MTA. They don't control or operate the city streets that the buses are often riding onto. That's the city. It's a little bit like if you only kind of control about 20% of the entire system, how can you be asked to fix the whole thing? Uh, and yet, somehow, that's the situation we're in. I want to throw this up just so folks may know. A couple months ago, actually, the Port Authority did a design competition to ask different teams to kind of think about how it could try to, to fix this. Um, and so there were kind of there, there were various uh, teams of architecture and design and engineering firms uh, who, who kind of came up with a couple different proposals. And these are just the footprints of the, of the different proposals. One of them essentially talked about expanding on the current footprint. Uh, three of them looked to, work, to move to a site to the south and the west. And one of them had what I think was actually a very innovative proposal to kind of take the basement of the Javits Convention Center and connect in directly to the Lincoln Tunnels. Um, this process, many people were critical of it because it's kind of seemed to be jumping the gun. Until you've actually done the planning about the size and the connections and other things, how can you kind of get to design? Um, and I do think that, in particular, one of the flaws of it is that it's been isolated, again, from the gateway conversation, other transit conversations and things. There has to be a broader conversation about trans-Hudson capacity and the connectivity to the entire transportation network in New York. Wherever you bring people on, you're going to suddenly be putting new demands on the transportation system and the network here in New York City. That said, what I would say we kind of learned from this is a few things. One, it's a very, very complicated issue. Um, two, the kind of moving the, the bus terminal south and west really makes the connections to transit worse. And even though there's talk about maybe building a second stop on the seven line or other things, it doesn't, it, 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 it probably causes kind of more problems than it solves. As I understand it, there's now kind of a, a renewed look at trying to think about whether the bus terminal could be built on the existing site. And I'd be interested to see what comes out of that. I will say, though, that I think that the Perkins Eastman proposal is something that ought to get a very fresh look. Um, it's a kind of it's an innovative idea about plugging directly into the Lincoln Tunnel. And it has a very close link to the 7 subway. Uh, it also frees up the existing site for, for, for redevelopment. And to make it a kind of fair comparison between the other proposals, there should be a kind of fair budget comparison. If this one is much less expensive than the, uh, than the others, there should be a thought about how that money could be invested in other uh, transit and transportation improvements uh, to make that work. That's kind of all I'll say about that right now. We're still trying to collect more information about this. But I, I do think that there's, there were some very interesting ideas that came up here that are worth looking at. 
Um, <clears throat> now let me switch to the, to the railroad side of things and just talk about that, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Bashan. Of course, we have this extraordinary wealth of, of uh, rail infrastructure that really makes New York City possible. Both our subways and our commuter railroads are the lifeblood uh, of our city and region. Um, but the weakest link of it is the Northeast Corridor and the tunnel under the Hudson River. Uh, this is the view from the Jersey side. It's simply two tracks going under the river. They're 106-year-old tunnels. Uh, they move with the tides on a daily basis, uh, and they flooded uh, during Superstorm Sandy. I've actually ridden through these tunnels in a special Amtrak car with floodlights and a viewing uh, system, and you don't see that much water under them on a day daily basis, I'm glad to say, but you do actually see puddles, and you see cracks in the concrete. And when you are underneath the Hudson River, that's not where you want to see water. Um, uh, so it's a very scary situation uh, with, with the Northeast Corridor. And of course, Penn Station itself. Uh, and Vashon will talk uh, probably in more detail about this, but it is a system way over capacity. Uh, it is, a, it is a, a daily affront to all the people who use it. Um, and, it and I think it drags down the entire community and neighborhood. Um, the other thing to realize is that going back to that Superstorm Sandy flooding, uh, the tunnels were damaged by the saltwater intrusion. And Amtrak has done a study uh, by engineers and experts who concluded that essentially within the next 20 years, and this study's a few years old, so the clock is ticking on us, they're going to need to shut those tunnels for over a year each to do massive repairs. They cannot repair the tunnels as quickly as they are, are, are crumbling, essentially. They're doing repairs as as frequently and as aggressively as they can, but they're going to need to go in and make, and make massive changes. Shutting one of those tunnels down, if we were to discover a, a crack tomorrow, it doesn't go, we don't see a 50% reduction by going from two to one, because the trains have to run in both directions. Penn Station doesn't have the capacity to just keep running all in one direction. You've got to keep running them in both directions, which essentially means you see a 75% decrease in capacity. And you go from 24 trains an hour, which is the kind of peak capacity of those two tracks, down to just six. This is the kind of blow that I think would create a recession. I think it would, I think it would really slow the commercial development and job growth in New York City. I think New Jersey would, would go, undergo a severe recession. I think the entire Northeast would feel this. I think that this would be something you could measure on the economic scale of the entire country. Uh, so this is the kind of crisis scenario that we're up against right now with these tunnels. And this is why the Gateway Project has become such a priority. Uh, and I'm glad to say that I've done panels with Chuck Schumer and Cory Booker and Bob Menendez. Uh, the, the Gateway Development Corporation had its first board meeting just a week ago. Uh, and we're seeing kind of quick federal action on both kind of uh, getting the permitting done and the funding uh, uh, for this. I, just got a call today saying that Governor Cuomo has put uh, significant money towards this in, in his budget. So we're seeing this project go forward, which is all to the good. And it's a complicated project that essentially it's not just tunnels under the Hudson River. Gateway should be thought of as a project that begins in downtown Newark at Newark Penn Station and goes all the way to 7th Avenue here in New York City. It includes replacing a couple bridges in New Jersey, uh, doubling the capacity under the Hudson River, coming up under the Hudson Yards and the concrete boxes that have been built, and very importantly, understanding, uh, oops, the slides are out of order, let me do it this way, actually coming into uh, Penn Station and building a new station to the south of the current Penn Station, Penn South. Because doubling the tracks into the existing, the, the, the constraints on capacity that we have right now uh, under the Hudson River are both the two tunnel, the two tracks, and Penn Station itself. So fixing the tunnels without adding new tracks and platforms does not add capacity. It would mean we wouldn't have uh, the guillotine over our heads uh, in terms of losing capacity, but it would not add the capacity for the kind of growth that we're talking about. So, so the current uh, kind of configuration of Gateway includes going all the way down and then building a new train station to the south of, uh, of Penn Station. One of the things that we're looking at, again, at, at, at RPA, is whether or not Gateway should actually be built as a through-running system. In the rest of the world, they don't build terminals anymore. Terminals have less capacity than through-running train stations. If instead of kind of ending at 7th Avenue,
Gateway goes all the way to Sunnyside, Queens, and I am talking about two new tunnels under the East River also, then you could go from potentially somewhere between, let's say, 20, 22 trains an hour to maybe 30 trains an hour. Uh, you're talking about a different alignment of the tracks and platforms, uh, uh, wider platforms, fewer tracks, because what you're trying to do is make a system where people get on and off the trains when it stops. Just think about this. Right now at Penn Station, every train, a full train pulls in from New Jersey or Long Island, people get off, an empty train pulls out. An empty train pulls in, people get on, and a full train pulls out. Half of the movements in and out of Penn Station today are empty trains. That's wasted capacity. So by running a through service out to Queens, which you can also, you create 50% more capacity under the East River, capacity that folks in Long Island and, uh, and Connecticut would love to see. And, so you, and, and of course, this would service the Penn Access Program that Governor Cuomo has championed, which would allow folks coming through uh, Fairfield County to come directly to Penn Station too. So th we think this would be a much better way to create connectivity uh, throughout the region. But it all then kind of boils down to, and I'll turn this over to Vishan now, what's going to happen at the nexus of this? Because when you start to think about, currently about 85,000 people are riding uh, under the existing, uh, through the existing Northeast Corridor into Penn Station on a daily basis, 75,000, give or take, on New Jersey Transit, about 10,000 on Amtrak. Amtrak sees the potential to grow their seller ridership. They're going to be buying new train sets and other things. And New Jersey certainly sees enormous pent-up demand uh, for growth there. But as you build these, these stations, you're going to be depositing more people in this neighborhood. And so what happens at the tracks and the platform and the station and the neighborhood level really matters. Because the experience of the customers, how they get to where they're trying to go, whether it's onto a subway or a bus or a street to walk somewhere to an office, is really going to be critical. I'll just say before I kind of close and, and turn it over to Vishan, is that from our perspective, we need all of this capacity. The region's growth really depends on this linkage, both again for New York, for New Jersey, for the entire Northeast. And so what we need to see is the gateway project built, built large with the maximum capacity it can. We need Penn South. We need Moynihan Station, which by the way, will provide a kind of early relief to allow us to do this kind of work and, and more capacity on the west side. And eventually, we're going to need Penn Station to be the kind of station that we really have all dreamed about and thought about. Because we're talking about going again from, say, 85 to maybe 200,000 people uh, coming through this station just from the west side. And with the 50% increase in capacity from the east, people coming from Connecticut and Long Island here. And so we've got to, be, we've got to have a station that can, that can accommodate all that. And what that means is a kind of system of stations that we bring online that really services all of that. So um, with that, I, I'd be happy to turn it over to Vishan. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Tom. Uh, that was really great. I know that <clears throat> I speak for a lot of people at CB5 and in Manhattan in general when I say that it's always good to learn more about New Jersey and about people coming from New Jersey. I mean, there are a lot of the people that, that we work with and that we're yelling at on the street, and so it's just good to, to have that information. Uh, so our next speaker is a uh, registered architect and the founder of the Practice for Architecture and Urbanism, who has worked on several major architecture and urban design projects including the master plan for the Domino Sugar Site in Williamsburg and Columbia University's Manhattanville campus. He's also an associate professor of practice at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. And prior to PAU, he was principal at Shop Architects, president of the Moynihan Station Venture, a director of the Department of City Planning's Manhattan office under Mayor Bloomberg, and associate partner at the New York City office of Skidmore, Skidmore Owings, and Merrill LP. Please welcome Vishan Chakrabarty. Um, thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, thank you to Community Board 5 for this very gracious invitation. When I worked in the Bloomberg administration, I often interacted with you. Sometimes we agreed, sometimes we didn't, but I always loved coming and talking to you. Um, this is on, right? Uh, I also just want to thank um, uh, uh, 
Tom and Michael. Uh, we've had a, a very interesting collaboration on all of this. Um, so I'm going to dive uh, right in here. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel that Tom spoke about. Um, and I think there's a way to solve many of the problems here locally having to do with some of the large regional issues that Tom just walked us through. Tom laid out for us a, a, a list of very important needs that have to do with the region's economy, have to do with our health as a city, and all of those things are absolutely true. Um, but I'm going to add something to that list, which is whether we still believe in the idea of the public. Um, the destruction of Penn Station in 1963, in my mind, was a sort of inflection point for the entire nation when we stopped believing in the idea of the public. And Lord knows we're at a critical moment in our political history right now. Um, but I believe that this project is actually, and part of why I'm absolutely OCD about it, is because it does represent whether we can do the right thing for the public or not. Um, you all know this place. It is a great place. It is a great neighborhood. Um, and what we're being told, basically, is that if you took this, and did that to it, <laughs> that it would be OK. It'd be the same exact neighborhood, right? It would be you know, just this, as, as, as wonderful a place as we know it today. And that this is just some little you know, fantasy project for architects who are worried about you know, why there isn't light and air in this station. Um, that's absurd. It gets even more absurd when you think about the fact that Penn Station handles twice as many people as Grand Central. It gets still even more absurd when you think about all of the growth that Tom just talked about. It is simply an unacceptable situation, and we should not let anyone try to uh, make us believe that this is some sort of vanity project. Um, and those differences actually start with the history of the um, development of these two stations. So these are drawings um, with Penn Station, the original Penn Station, on the left. Uh, and Grand Central on the right. And in the dark outline, what you're seeing is all of the land that was assembled uh, when the new stations were built. So Grand Central, from its beginning, was known as Terminal City. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt built it with the state legislature. And it was really, you know, really was built as the nation's first transit-oriented development uh, project. Excuse me one second. Just adjust my mic. Drop this. There. Um, and so there was this whole idea that you would create a neighborhood with a train station. Penn was never about this. Penn was about getting national rail anywhere into Manhattan they could figure it out. They bought the cheapest land that they could at the time. They built a grand station that was really designed in some ways like a suburban station. And I'll explain that in a second. So they acquired very little land around it and um, really had um, no relationship to the neighborhood around it. So, uh, in all of these drawings, uh, 8th Avenue is in the middle of the screen. And those are the tracks that they built in roughly 1910. Um, and what you're seeing is between 8th Avenue and 9th Avenue, the tracks come out of the tunnels and they start to fan out. And then they become parallel between 7th and 8th Avenue, which is really where the heart of the station has historically been and continues to be today. And you'll see on the upper left there, this was the largest construction project in North America at the time. It was an extraordinary feat. Um, and I won't belabor this with too much history, but if someone wants to talk about the history later, we can do that. Um, Penn was built in 1910. It was one of uh, the largest train stations the country had ever seen. Uh, what I'd like to point out, especially because we're in Community Board 5, and I, um, is Look at the difference in scale between the station and what was around it. This was the Tenderloin. Um, the land was cheap. They bought up four blocks fairly quickly and quietly. Um, and they actually displaced a number of African-American families that shifted up to Harlem. This was, in some ways, the beginnings of Black Harlem um, to build this um, extraordinary station. Um, and then they built Farley. And the reason Farley was there, and this was all built by the private sector, mind you, the reason Farley was there is because the mail cars were always on the western end of the train. So when a train pulled in from Philadelphia or Boston or Washington, passengers were using the station between 7th and 8th, and mail was being pulled up into Farley's courtyard. 
It was a very efficient system. They made money on it. Um, the Farley was built as a very secure building because uh, cash was uh, sent by mail. Um, and so then, you know, when we started doing some forensics on the station itself, what we found out is the station, as grand as it was, and you know, there's that terrible thing when you go to Penn Station today, and the pictures of the old station are everywhere, there to tease you, you know, really there to really. Uh, as grand as that station was, it was incredibly internalized. It was not about um, its sort of tentacles out to the neighborhood the way Grand Central is. Um, and it was really a, an extraordinary world that Penn Central Railroad built inside the station. Um, and in fact, it had very, it didn't have subway connections. It had two chauffeur kind of uh, locations for drop off and pick up. So the whole idea in the original station was you came in on national rail, you were fairly wealthy, a car picked you up and took you off to wherever you were going. Interestingly, all of those beautiful pictures we see of the original station were really intended for national rail riders. Commuters were underground from the beginning. Um, and commuters were always thought of as sort of second-class citizens. And it's interesting because, of course, the Tony suburbs were Westchester and Connecticut. New Jersey were not, New Jersey and Long Island were not the Tony suburbs. And so they got kind of the second-class treatment in the station even then. Um, now, what's interesting about the original station that's very relevant to today is the main part of the train station where you got on and off the trains, uh, which is pictured right there on the left, is exactly where Madison Square Garden sits today on the red outline. And the reason for that, the reason the original station designers placed the station there, the, the, the main boarding area, is because that's the center of the tracks and platforms. Basically, across that entire two-block length, the center is really right there uh, uh, on, on 8th Avenue between 7th and 8th. Um, and that becomes very important to our conversation. So life goes on. Farley was expanded. There was actually a Greyhound bus terminal where One Penn Plaza is. And that is, in some ways, to me, the sort of harbinger of things to come. By the 50s, Eisenhower has passed the Federal Highway Act. People are taking cars much more and planes much more than they are trains to go cross country and so forth. So national pa pa passenger rail is declining. But what's happened in the interim, as Tom just sort of laid out, is commutation has really started to increase. Levittown has been built. Right? People are taking commuter trains. There are now some 200,000 people a day as commuters using the station, even though the old station is about to be torn down because National Rail has gone bankrupt. So you probably all know the story of the fact that, um, so basically what happens here is the Penn Central Railroad knows it's going bankrupt, decides to sell the station and the land above the station to private interests, and only keeps the ownership below grade, which is why today the ownership above the sidewalk is held privately. The ownership below the sidewalk is held by the public sector for the most part. Um, we did something kind of strange. We did these forensics on how they did the demolition because one of the most interesting things is that the station never closes during all this construction. They demolish this enormous Beaux-Arts building. They build a 20,000-seat arena and a skyscraper on its site, and they never shut down a station where 200,000 people a day are going through it. And the reason, and it, the other interesting thing they did is that they demolished the station from the inside out because you had um, organizations, civic groups, protesting the demolition of the station outside. So they were trying to hide the demolition as much as possible. So in order to keep people safe under the station, what they did, if you can make it out, that piece of steel that's going across that image, that is a platform that's built at sidewalk level that capped all the mezzanine levels of Penn Station. So basically, they built this enormous manhole cover and placed it on top of the old station. And to me, one of the things that's interesting about this is we're told a bit of a myth about this entire thing. The Penn Station was destroyed in its entirety, and this, everything that's there now was new. That's not really true. It's really what's known as kind of a palimpsest, a layering of history, because the old station is literally sitting underneath um, uh, the garden today. And what's fascinating, if you take a good look at that picture, that's the facade of the old station on 7th Avenue with the superstructure of Madison Square Garden rising behind it. Uh, and that's roughly 1967. Um, which gets you to today. 
uh, and, the and the situation that we have today. Um, and that also, you know, so it brings us to the inside of the station. This, of course, is the garden spot of Penn Station, um, the Amtrak boarding area. Um, that ceiling is the manhole cover they built in 1965. Uh, that's what they used to not only protect the passengers, but ultimately that formed the ceiling of the, the station today. Um, and then this floor is the original mezzanine level, the first mezzanine level of the station. The level below, which is really uh, fun, um, is the same floor as the uh, station also from back then, the second mezzanine level right above the trains. Most of this floor has an 11 foot ceiling. This is where the vast majority of people are in the station because this is where the commuters, and Tom just walked you through the numbers, this is where all the commuters are switching from commuter trains to the subway. Um, and so any of you who have to live the indignity of this at rush hour knows what this feels like. Um, and, and I myself, always, I go, go through the station quite often, always worry about safety conditions as well. Uh, so fast forward to the mid-1990s, our late senator, Patrick Moynihan, who was a shoeshine boy in the original station, uh, saw Farley across the street and had this idea. There's a McKimmeden White Beaux-Arts building across the street. The, tra the tracks are underneath it. Let's put the new train station there. Now, for those of you, I have a little survey to do. For those of you who remember this from the 90s, how many of you thought all of Penn Station, maybe some of you think this still, how many of you thought all of Penn Station was moving lock, stock, and barrel to the Farley building back then? Roughly, right? So this is a good percentage of the audience. Um, I think our fair senator um, let this myth per, you know, kind of prevail. Uh, I think only those in the know really understood the fact that Farley, because it sat on the far west end of the train shed, over platforms and tracks that are largely unchangeable, that Farley was only going to shear off a small percentage of the riders of Penn. Um, and that doesn't mean that it isn't useful for the reasons that Tom talked about, but it does have its limitations. So this architectural proposal was way over budget. It had all sorts of problems. The railroads didn't really like it that much. Farley itself is a, is a strange building. It's the only building I can find um, built in the 20th century with a moat around it. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, of course, is the post office and its um, sense of security. It's a beautiful Beaux-Arts building, but it's a fortress. And it's hard to imagine how a train station or any other kind of uh, sort of normal development inside of that fortress is going to somehow be a catalyst for change in this neighborhood. Um, but the real issue is that now we're talking about Amtrak moving to Farley. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, Amtrak probably needs that space. It does work well for a variety of reasons. But the vast majority of people will still be underneath the garden. The numbers of those people, as Tom just laid out, are growing. And so now you have a sort of inequity issue. The average Amtrak rider is much wealthier than the average commuter. And those people are relegated to the same old station. So the day after Farley opens, and all of these people are still shuffling through an 11-foot ceiling, I think most of those people are going to be like, who just stole my wallet? Like, what just happened here? How did we spend a billion and a half dollars building a train station in Farley that doesn't serve my interests whatsoever? And that's true for this entire commuter ship. Um, and so the issue, again, goes back to the fact that the garden sits at the center of the tracks and the platforms. Um, and so, sure, will some westbound commuters who are going to Hudson Yards and so forth use Farley? I'm sure that's true. But even the best number I've heard for the numbers of people using Farley is about 20%, which leads half a million people a day underneath Madison Square Garden. Um, Ten years ago, we tried to fix this. Um, I was part of a venture with Vornado Realty Trust and Related, and we were trying to, and we got actually quite far with the idea of moving Madison Square Garden to the back of the Farley building, building a train station in the front of the Farley building, and then building a new rail station where the garden sits today at the center of the tracks and the platforms. We actually had support from Michael's paper. We had support um, from various uh, uh, um, uh, parts of the civic community. There were issues. I'll talk about that in a second. But the whole idea was you would remove that ceiling, and you would somehow daylight um, the station, um, and you would 
fit Farley in the back, excuse me, fit the garden in the back of the Farley building. It did fit. There's a lot of misnomer out there about uh, what the problems were back then. This was not one of them. You could fit the garden. The garden signed a document, said that they would move. Um, this actually got quite far along. Um, they were getting a full 20,000 seat arena. Um, they were getting the loading dock they needed as community board four and five members, you know, the loading dock situation on 33rd street. Um, they were getting the loading dock they needed. There was still a train station that was quite a robust train station in the front of the building. The real problem with that plan back then was no one knew once you move the garden, how to pay for a new station where the garden sits today. The, the cheapest estimates were six, seven billion dollars. And this is because if you compare this to the train station at the World Trade Center site, you've got 10 times the number of people going through it every day. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult and disruptive to build a brand new train station here. Um, and also, part of the reason that this was being pursued was Hudson Yards, as you well know, upzoned the garden site. So there's five and a half million square feet available on that site. And so the whole deal was that the garden would get a free arena in the back of the Farley building, and the development community would get the ability to, to develop that five and a half million square feet. This plan was developed. Um, the railroads looked at it. NYPD counterterrorism looked at it. And, so, you know, and basically building those two towers and a train station on top of the operating train station was going to be like doing open heart surgery on the patient while they were jogging. Um, it was incredibly difficult to build. Um, and so uh, we started looking at a plan B, which was just to build a train station, although there's a lot of retail there, uh, in some people's eyes, too much retail, and then sprinkle the uh, air rights around the station, sort of like Grand Central in, in a development transfer rights mechanism, Hard. Not a lot of landing sites, as you know. Areas already fairly upzoned. You know, we were struggling with that at the time. So this is all early 2008. We're working with this. We're working with the governor's office. We're working with the mayor's office. And um, there was uh, uh, opposition from uh, some parts of the preservation community who were very worried about what the garden's presence would do to the Farley building. Um, this is controversial, but I still believe that those are completely solvable issues. Um, but they did run this ad in the Times, and so it, it was an interesting moment in time. That moment came to a crashing close, however. Um, I was on an Amtrak train going to Washington to talk to some legislators about Moynihan Station when suddenly everyone's Blackberry exploded. Um, and uh, Elias Spitzer resigned. He, to his credit, actually, he knew the project, he liked the project, he got the project, he wanted to get the project done. Um, he had other interests. Um, <laughs> The gar after this happened, the garden pulled out of the deal several weeks later. Um, I think they made the right business decision. Barclays was coming up in Brooklyn. They knew they had issues in terms of renovating in place versus stay trying to move to the back of Farley. They chose to renovate in place. Um, and I understand their business decision to do that. But the point is, that's really what collapsed that deal. Then Lehman Brothers fell, and then sort of nothing happened until now. So this is the inside of the Amtrak station in Farley. I think the price tag is somewhere around a billion and a half dollars. I think it's a perfectly fine project. I think it is necessary, particularly as you start to think about construction on the other side. But again, this is going to serve Amtrak, which is about 5 to 7% of the ridership at Penn, and then maybe another 15% of the commuters who are headed westward, leaving, as I said before, about a half a million people under the garden because it sits uh, uh, right at the center of the tracks, as I said before, but now add Gateway. Now, Tom just talked about Penn South. Penn South, as I'm sure some of you know, is not just Block 780, which is the block uh, between 7th and 8th, um, right below the garden, but also pieces of the avenues on either side. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about now adding more people into the station. Now, I'm all for Gateway. I'm a board member of the RPA. I couldn't believe in it more. But I would submit to you that the thought that you're going to add a single person into that station without doing something about the station itself is madness. And that thinking about doing that and saying, well, Farley is the answer, when Farley sits catty corner from where these new people are going to be coming, 
is also madness. Because if you look at the track and platform plan for Gateway, what you find out is the vast majority of people who are coming in the new tracks and tunnels are going to be going into that 11 foot high corridor system, also trying to transfer into the subway system and so forth. So this is a very significant problem. We know we need to build Gateway. How are we going to handle the extraordinary pressure it's going to put on already an overpressurized system? Now, this also gets to, I think, a very sensitive topic, and I don't want to be in any way disrespectful or glib about this, but the gateway plans, in order to build Penn South and build those seven uh, uh, tracks for platforms, will require eminent domain and the, uh, the condemnation of about 2.2 million square feet uh, directly south of Madison Square Garden. Uh, it's cut and cover construction. It's right below the sidewalk. There's no way to build those tracks and platforms without those buildings coming down. And again, I don't want to be in any way glib about that. There might be people who have businesses on that block or interests on that block. But it is a reality that to build those tracks, those buildings need to come down. Um, what is interesting about that is it provides a possibility that we never had 10 years ago, which is that the gardens air rights, at least the majority of them, could transfer to those blocks uh, after the gateway construction is done, which means that there is a financing mechanism, just like there was 10 years ago, to move the garden. In other words, the garden gets a free arena in the back of Farley in exchange for its air rights, um, which I think is quite a deal. The garden has moved, I believe, four times in its history. It was in Madison Square, which is why it's called Madison Square Garden. Um, it's, uh, it's over 50 years old now. It needs a new facility. I believe that the right deal could be struck with the garden to move into the back of Farley. So I'm just going to close now with the, the big question, which is if you assume that the garden could move to the back of Farley or elsewhere, what do you do on the garden site? How do you afford a new train station? And when we started thinking about this, and I should say we started thinking, of, we've, I've been obsessed about this for a long time, but we started thinking about this in a very focused way when Michael and his colleagues um, at the New York Times asked us to think about it um, and to sort of create some sort of idea that was maybe a little more advanced than simply doing Farley, but of actually doing more than Farley. Uh, so what's the problem? The problem with building a new train station is you've got to bring foundations into the existing tracks. And that's a very complicated, very expensive mess. Um, we thought about spanning over it. That's also a very complicated, uh, expensive mess. Um, and then I came across this photograph. And I was kind of beguiled by it, because I started thinking to myself, why do we need to build a new structure at all? There are foundations down there. There's a structure that's actually quite handsome, with just an incredibly ugly skin on it. Um, and if the garden were to move, if the garden were to move to the back of the Farley building, could this structure be recycled? Could it be the new commuter pavilion that we need located precisely in the location that we need it, which is above the center of the tracks and the platforms? Could it be a fairly light, delicate, and fairly inexpensive piece of architecture, uh, relatively speaking? Um, and what's interesting is when you scoop the garden out, and if Amtrak moves to Farley, so you can take that first mezzanine level out, that space with the 11-foot ceiling suddenly jumps to 153-foot ceiling, um, comparable, you know, higher than the Pantheon, um, higher than Grand Central. Um, and interestingly, that period in when the garden was built, the circular form actually had this resonance with the idea of gateway. Uh, it was this idea of representing and symbolizing the world. Uh, I love that Pan Am terminal. I, it's a, it was sad to see it go. Um, so we thought, and, and I think Stefano said this perfectly, actually, at the outset, which is there are all these pieces in play. People are planning Farley. There are people planning improvements to the station entrances on 7th Avenue, under the Long Island Railroad concourse. You've got the federal government now talking about Gateway. But what is this place? Like, what's the sum of these parts? Who's looking at that issue? And we believe that there's this kind of donut of planning going on, each entity in their own individual fiefdom. Um, there's this donut of planning going on. And we believe this idea sort of injects jelly in the heart of that donut uh, by pulling all of that together in a fairly simple and straightforward way. Hello, Gail. Um, 
And so imagine reusing that structure, a fairly light pavilion structure, actually not a lot of retail, mainly just open down to the tracks and platforms below. Imagine now the bridge is gone between the garden to Penn Plaza. So imagine a dignified taxiway uh, in going both north and south when you get out of a train and just simply walking to your destination. And so what this would mean is you would get a new Madison Square Garden in the back of Farley. You'd have Moynihan Station in the front of Farley. And then you would have the largest enclosed civic space in New York City handling, uh, again, uh, about those half a million people a day that would be coming through the station and growing with Gateway. Um, we, this is not just cosmetic. We would accept and build all of the Gateway's concourse plans, their vertical circulation, elevators for the disabled on every single platform. Um, the garden has a tremendous number, I believe 368 local columns that come down into the station. We could remove about 70% of those, which means that a lot of those platforms, when you're, you know, you're trying to shuffle for room, it's because you're trying to get around a column. Uh, we think we can eliminate most of those columns because we don't have anything to hold up in the middle of the building. Um, one of the things we want to do is not only make it sustainable from an from a energy standpoint, but also sustainable from a financial standpoint. And so we've developed a passive cooling and passive heating system with a double skin glazing around the structure of the garden that allows you to uh, basically deal with summer conditions and winter conditions without big expensive heating and cooling systems. Uh, the other thing that does that I think is critically important is it allows you to have open access all the way around the perimeter of the structure, which means in the event of a fire, in the event of an incident, you can get people out of the station quickly. They'll know where they're going. There's blast-proof glass, and most importantly, smoke purge, so that you can pull smoke out of the building in the event of a fire. It's fairly easy and not very disruptive to build because the structure and the foundations are already there. So you protect the entrances, you pull the skin off, you take the bridge down between the two buildings, you reclad the building, and suddenly you've got this new station sitting at the heart of what I think is a new neighborhood. And, and when people say we don't have the money to pay for it, we had a cost estimate done. Uh, this costs about a billion dollars, which is very little money in the parlance of this kind of project. But the other important thing is, think about what this would do for this neighborhood. Tom talked about all those people who are coming from New Jersey. Today, people from Westchester and Connecticut have the benefit of taking a commuter train and then getting on, out at a nice station and they walk to their place of business. Most people in New Jersey come into this station, or Long Island, come into the station, then they have to transfer to a subway to get downtown or to East Midtown. Most of them won't house their employees. They wouldn't do it to their employees to have them in this neighborhood because the neighborhood has so much latent value in it that there's so much that we can do just by transforming this neighborhood, just like we've done with Bryant Park and uh, Columbus Circle and every other part of Midtown. Ima For those of you who are old-time New Yorkers, imagine someone telling you 15 years ago that Bryant Park was going to be a world-class address. That can happen here. Uh, and it, it's tremendously important, I think, for the people who own this, uh, the land in this neighborhood, as well as the people who are part of the community in this neighborhood. So I'll close with some before and afters. This is looking up 8th Avenue, before and after. Uh, you see the map, just like the sort of stars of Grand Central, you see the map of New York City on the ceiling. Um, the southwest corner of the station, before um, and after, you see that porosity going out to the streets because you've got the passive heating and cooling. So baffles would come down for inclement weather, but most of the time it would be free-flowing and open, just like King's Cross in London and other new stations. Durable materials, uh, fairly inexpensive. You come out at the platform, and now you suddenly... And by the way, that brass railing is from the original station. Um, you would, of course, save that. But you would look up and you'd see the city. You would look up and you'd have the arrival experience of arriving in one of the greatest cities in the world, as opposed to looking at the underbelly of Madison Square Garden. Uh, you'd come out of the subway, and you'd know immediately where you're going. That first mezzanine level's gone, so those even in the lower ceiling parts, you're talking about 30-foot ceilings. And then um, just the final slide, which is looking from the breezeway looking west, uh, the view today uh, versus what it would be like in the future. This is completely achievable. This is much less hard 
than what we've done at the Trade Center site, than what we've done at Hudson Yards, what we're doing with Eastside Access. If New York can't pull this up, we should just fold up shop and go home. Uh, this is just not that hard to do. So thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Vishan, for that <clears throat> really inspiring look at, at what's possible. Um, before moving into our moderated discussion, we're going to collect uh, any questions that have been written down. So if you have written down some questions, please go ahead and pass those cards to the end of your row. We'll have people going up and down the aisles to collect it from you guys. We you guys could do that now. Um, and while you guys are doing that, I'll just add that um, you know, I've seen a lot of presentations about, about Penn Station and you know, every single time, I it's I never, I never not feel uh, like it's really remarkable. And um, I think this one is in particularly inspiring, both from a lot of levels. Both obviously, it's a beautiful and creative idea, but the practicality of it's also inspiring. I find. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator for the evening. He is the New York Times architecture critic and a key voice on issues of public space, infrastructure, social responsibility, and more. Recent articles of note include a new vision for Penn Station, an analysis of the Santiago Calatrava designed World Trade Center Transit Hub, a piece on the impact of thousands of new streetlights in Detroit, and an interview with the lead designer of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Michael was the Times art critic as well as a foreign correspondent in Europe and is the author of several books. In 2014, he was awarded the Brendan Gill Prize for his writing on New York City's architectural environment and was a finalist for the 2000 Pulitzer Prize in Criticism. Criticism. Please welcome Michael Kimmelman, joined by Tom and Vishan. Should we sit in front of our names? <laughs> yeah. Hmm? You should go in the middle, shouldn't you? No. Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> yeah, All right, I'll go back. It's okay, we're architects. <laughs> so, um, thank you guys. Uh, Sean, that, that's a good idea. I, I had never <laughs> thought of moving the garden. That's, that's a nice idea. Um, okay, so there's so many things we, we were talking about here, both in terms of specifically at the Penn Station site and also in the area in general. So let's see if we can begin to unpack these things and also what some of the obstacles are to this. Sure. So... Um, one thing we didn't talk about, and maybe we can get into a little bit, is the relationship of, and you, you, you were hinting at this, but um, you were more than hinting yeah, at it, but, but sorry, sorry, that's weird. Um, but the, the, the way in which we might have a conversation about the larger area, because as Vishan quite correctly pointed out, what makes Grand Central a great place is because it was conceived as part of an, a large urban fabric. It was a part of a neighborhood. It helped that neighborhood grow. Um, we're talking about doing the same thing around uh, Penn Station. But the Port Authority is part of this neighborhood, too. So let's, let's just stop for a second and say, play devil's advocate and say, fine, it, it's easy for us to sit here, say, let's take Port Authority, and we move it over to Javits, and then we take Madison Square Garden, and we move it into the back of Farley. And then we put Gateway in here. What, basically, what, what's I assume most people uh, reading these sort of things feel is, look, you know, we could barely manage to build one subway station uh, in <laughs> 60 years, right. um, and now you're talking about multi-billion-dollar things. So, both of you, help 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 me understand how we make a case to the public and to government officials and others that these sort of large moves can be thought of together and are not just the usual kind of sure. dreaming. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll start with it. Look, I, I think that in some ways the greatest challenge to this is that when you start to lay out the pieces, people say, it's just going to get too complicated. There are too many moving parts. Simplify it, keep it simple, and kind of try to stay with one piece. Um, Again, going back to, say, the bus terminal issue, any one piece of it, part of the problem is that when you take one element and you try to only focus on one simple piece, you fail to address the bigger problems. 
you can't just, if you build the tunnel under the Hudson River and you don't do anything, if you don't build Penn South and you don't do anything about Penn Station, you won't have any new capacity and you won't handle the growth. Trying to move the bus terminal without thinking about how it connects in with the transit network or where it goes and how people are going to get from their buses to where they're at actually trying to go doesn't work. None of these pieces kind of works by themselves in isolation. Um, but each of them together is complementary. Um, I, I remember 10 years ago, too, when we were trying to do the kind of the big plan, the big move and all this stuff. And there was a sense even before, you know, Elliot Spitzer's um, uh, problem surfaced that it was a kind of grandiose plan and that it kind of fell of its own weight. I, I think that a couple key things have changed. We're talking about this today in this time when it's very clear that the growth pressure in New York City is greater than it's been in my lifetime, you know, probably in several generations. We're talking about this at a time that Hudson Yards is not just a kind of idea, but actually a fact that is growing and succeeding. And, and really, I want to give credit to Vishan. Until Vishan came along with this proposal and shared it with me, every idea of moving the garden fell apart when you said, so what would you do with the site? Because there was no good proposal for what to do between 7th and 8th Avenues after the garden moved. Whether it was a big train station or towers or other things, it seemed like an extraordinary expense for kind of a marginal improvement. Um, then Vishan came up with this proposal of, you know, leaving the, the, the drum in place and building that open thing. And suddenly it kind of unlocks all of these other opportunities. Do you want to say something about that? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, Michael, you know, I mean, you, you travel the world, you see what the rest of the world is building. Um, London's building Crossrail right now, right? We, you know, we are, the, 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 the conversation's almost, you know, embarrassing, yeah, right? It is. In, in, in the sense of what we simply are not able to do in the face of, I mean, I was born in Calcutta. Calcutta has an airport that blows our airports away, you know? So Joe Biden is wrong when he talks about the third world airports. They're better, um, you know? Um, yeah. You know, so, so this is somewhat embarrassing, but the point is, it is what it is. Um, I do think in New York, we have this more recent history of we need a couple of bites at the apple, yeah. right? Sometimes there's a big idea. The big idea, it falls under its own weight. I agree with the criticism of what happened 10 years ago. I think there was this sense that it was just too complicated. Um, so fine, if people want to say we've got to deal with the art of the possible, Right? I can accept that. But this is possible. I mean, no one's going to tell me this is impossible or that it's somehow too complicated for us to pull off. It's just a question of political will. Uh, I really believe it's, it, it comes completely down to that. It comes down to the leadership. Um, and the one other thing I would just say about it is we are still living with the history of what Robert Moses and Al Smith did in terms of shifting power to Albany uh, on the major national infrastructure pieces that impact New York City, right? Um, and so we have this very difficult process now where everything is this dance between the mayor and the governor, and I just think that, and the Port Authority, yeah. right? And I think that just makes it very, very complicated in the way, you know, London's the seat of power for, for the United Kingdom, so it can deal with this differently. I mean, I think there are several issues that um, you touch on. One is that the conversation around this struck me from the beginning when I entered this conversation with you, really. Because you were coming from Europe. <laughs> yeah. What was that it was always a very siloed conversation. And, and by that I mean that also you had, um, you, and you still have this, and this is, I think, something that needs to be overcome. You, you had, after all, lots of different kinds of interests um, and a lot of people who didn't talk to each other. So mm -hmm. you had the transit interests, you had landmarks people who were concerned about the effect on the Farley building. You had architects who come up with, you know, their own projects which are fascinating to them but seem unrealistic. And so there was, I think, and there continues to be a great deal of skepticism about anything and in whose interest um, uh, it, it is put forward. And I think w w uh, partly I see my job, but I also think um, it's the job of, politicians and those people who are in the 
in the public realm to make clear why these things are, uh, why these moves, these issues and these moves uh, serve across mm -hmm. interests. They're not, um, I mean, you repeatedly said it's not a vanity project, and I think that's, that grows out of this perception that somehow doing something to this is a frivolous addition yeah. to the fundamental task, which is to improve capacity and deal with transit. And, you know, that gateway is the main priority and everything else is sort of, which it is, but everything else is somehow, like, if we can only do one thing, let us do that, instead of seeing this as being these mutually dependent moves. Right, right. I mean, let me, let me take one piece just to expand on that. We've looked at transit operations around the world, and they put the customer experience at the core of everything they do. They take it very seriously. This is not just a kind of slogan but in whether it's London, Paris, Singapore, Hong Kong, kind of the customer experience is, is central to everything they think about. What does that mean? It means that they share information about uh, delays and when the next train or bus is coming and things much, much faster. They provide um, kind of the easiest possible transfer through the systems and all these things. And they make it possible for people to get into the system and out of the system as quickly as possible. That's not, um, that's not frivolous. That's not an add-on. It's actually a fundamental piece of, of the system. When we look at the growth of the region and kind of the next three million people who we think will live here over the next 25 plus years, most of those folks will be over 65. Almost all of the growth, about uh, three quarters of the growth of population in our city and region is gonna be in the over 65 cohort. And so how people get around and providing accessibility for that, not just the folks here on the stage being over 65, but kind of literally <laughs> um, wow. the overall. And so, and so how um, accessible are, it's, it's not just a kind of ADA requirement that you do because the federal government tells you to. You do it because it's the right thing to do and because it's going to be a more important thing for the future population that we're planning for than it is even for us today. I think especially since you're the architecture critic for the New York Times, I think this is, you know, we view, and I think architects are very much to blame for some of this, um, we view architecture as a luxury product, right? And if you've got a bunch of architects going around designing luxury condos, that doesn't help the situation. But so many, I, I can't tell you how many times 10 years ago, an elected official, and I, and I was sympathetic, would look at me and say, you know, I'm trying to fund Head Start. Get out of my office. I don't care whether the station's ugly, right? And, and I, I get that. I get that. But the, the thing is, this isn't about the station being ugly. This is about experience. It's about safety, yeah. Yeah. right? So and, it's it's about the, it, and it's about the economic redevelopment of an enormous chunk of Manhattan, right? right? So it's about much more than just architecture. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've always felt that, and both of you know this, because uh, I've said this to both of you all, and, We've talked about this, but um, I think framing the conversation in terms of those two things, that is, that is public, uh, well, three things, okay? So public dignity, let's just not say convenience, but the question of which is the, how you framed the whole project at the beginning, what are we as a society yeah. and what are our priorities? So it's not just that it's a nicer place, um, but it's, it's about the dignity of the people who use it and our respect for citizens. But beyond that, I think there are these two fundamental issues. One is, if we frame this conversation in terms of economic development um, and see this as absolutely critical to the welfare of the city, um, then I think a lot of the objections that people have, which often come down to the money, can be dealt with or at least yeah. confronted on its own level. But then lastly, we never have this conversation because we're all uncomfortable about this. But it is a, th this place is a deeply unsafe place. We all know this, everybody who deals with it, the police know this, uh, everybody knows this. The fire department knows this, Penn Station is, is a very dangerous place. You mentioned King's Cross several times. Those of you who don't know, King's Cross, the station in London, um, had a, was very similar, a high, served commuter traffic, was a wreck, was a known fire trap, had a fire, people died. That finally spurred the uh, renovation and, and renewal of that station, which has in turn triggered phenomenal economic uh, growth uh, in 
in the area around King's Cross. So, I mean, I think having an open conversation about the actual reasons for doing this um, and not uh, pussyfooting around it too much is, is key. Just a quick thing on that. The station was built for about 120,000 yeah. passengers a day. It's handling 650, right? So it doesn't take a technical wizard, right, to understand the, the, the issue with this. Right. The, but it would never pass codes today. It would not be allowed. Right. If you tried to come and it is propose in this, yeah. it, would, right. it would never be. So l let me play devil's advocate and say, okay, this is fine. Um, but there are all these other priorities. There are limited funds. So there are other proposals out there for things that could be done to um, make the station a little better. Um, and you alluded to them in one of your um, sure. uh, images, which are improvements on the 7th Avenue side and on the 33rd Street side. We've seen the closing of 33rd Street, the pedestrianization of it as a, um, as a kind of experiment, which is... Um, part of that. Uh, and those uh, plans, um, we ha that have not been made public, mm -hmm. but we, we know there are proposals out there. And the governors, the, the sort of struck me, and increasingly I think this is important uh, to focus on, everyone was focused on Farley, me too, uh, when this uh, announcement was made by the governor. But the other component of this, and it, it, th there were two parts, right, to what yeah. he was proposing. One was what we will do in Farley, but the other was what we will do to improve the existing station. And he talked about improving, uh, you know, exactly the condition you were describing in the concourse, which is extremely dangerous and actually kind of frightening for various reasons. One, one of them is you have no idea where you are. You can't orient yourself. You don't know where you're going. So uh, this is not a small thing. And then there's tremendous congestion. In the end, the governor came up with something which involves taking the existing concourse on that north side and widening it a little bit and putting a fake um, drop ceiling with an image of LED image of the sky sure. um, that goes along this. I mean, it's... I want the real sky. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's hilarious, but it's also... Um, yeah. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean right? that actually. I mean, no, look, no, no, no. It, there, there were, as, as, as Michael knows, I mean, there are more ambitious ideas about yeah. that. First of all, we should realize that for everything we're talking about, as Sean has said, you know, Moynihan, now, there will be more growth to the West, and I think that's part of the benefit of Moynihan, is that we're going to build Hudson Yards, and so Moynihan will be important. And Moynihan, by moving ahead now, creates the opportunity to do other things. So there are they're good reasons to be, to be firmly, I think, in favor of Moynihan. But... Most people are still going east, 7th Avenue and to the north. And so the 7th Avenue entrance and the Long Island Railroad concourse are an important piece of this. And there are out there more ambitious ideas about what to do in terms of opening up to 7th Avenue. And when I said, you know, I, I don't want LEDs of the sky, I want the real sky, I'm not being facetious. I mean, a partial closing of 33rd Street and opening up to the sky the way with a canopy over it, um, could be a much, much better way to kind of approach that. And they all complement each other. Yeah. You could be doing the improvements exactly. to the Long Island Railroad concourse now exactly. to create the opportunity to make Fashan's move. And, and you can, you can, you can so, see how exactly. Moynihan, how, how Penn South, how the Long Island Railroad concourse, and frankly also East Side Access. Mm -hmm. And this is the external thing to keep in mind. In about six years, give or take, over half of, I'm, I'm optimistic. I know. Um, uh, you know, some 60% of Long Island Railroad riders are going to shift to trains that'll take, give them a one-seat ride to Grand Central. The day that opens up is when we got to hit the ground and start doing the big moves. And so that's kind of, to, to my way of thinking, that's deadline. the clock, the deadline. Because that's the window of opportunity. If Moynihan is open, East Side Access opens up, we, we, we decant some of the pressure, some of the 650 on Penn Station, we make the big moves then so that we can eventually bring in Penn Access and Metro North, and Long Island will start to grow again. So that's what we have to kind of but look for. Can, uh, let me just do two things. First of all, do, when I'm talking here about this concourse issue, does everybody here know what I'm talking about? You know, uh, how many raise your hand say, yet yeah, if you know what I'm talking about? And how many of you, may ask, were struck by the governor's proposal, that part of it, or were you focused on probably two? Like when you heard about that, did you think, okay, that's a solution? 
Or how many of you thought, okay, that's a solution? Anybody? How many of you thought that was a big issue? Unsolved? Not so many, yeah, but a, a few, yeah? So l let me ask you then as a political matter, um, my, my impression is that the governor has lots of motivations for doing what he's doing and for in Farley and elsewhere, as he does with LaGuardia and Kennedy. Um, there must be some political rationale behind the idea that he did not pick up on Vishan's idea immediately um, and that he put forward a concourse plan. Oh, oh, <laughs> help me, help, but help, help oh. me understand. Let, somebody here, yeah. Tom. Um, uh, oh, is it that time already? <laughs> No, but, uh, no but look, uh, tell me you know, what the rationale is, is from, from well, look, the Look, I, I, I want to be really uh, cautious here just because I, I remember a friend once saying to me, you know, Tom, you do the policy. One thing politicians are good at is politics. And yeah. we, have, we have, you know, better uh, people at that than me here. So I kind of assume that, that, that the governor and other people have, have a good understanding of the politics. I will say that every time I talk about this, it's a sold-out event. Anytime there's a publication, people are running for it. I think that there's an enormous public desire to see more amb ambitious proposals here. And but, um, uh, well, let me let me do yeah. it for you then. Let's just say I'm the governor. Um, I want to do what's practical, and I can, right. and that's something that I control. So I'm going to control the concourse area that is under my right. aegis. I'm going to do something that has a budget that I can somehow understand. All this other stuff, too many moving parts. Right. Oh. But, I, you know, I, I think there's plenty of room for sympathy or empathy here, having been a former low-level government <laughs> official. Um, this stuff's hard, and I understand the logic that says do not let the perfect get in the way of the good. And there are places for incremental change and incremental benefit, and all of that makes sense. Um, T to me, the, the key issue here is that we don't do anything that precludes the larger benefit, right? And I think that many of the things that you just talked about, you know, improvements to concourses, the station in Farley, all of that is to the good. The question is what would preclude something like this yeah. from happening? And, you know, because, look, I, and I don't mean any disrespect to this governor or any other governor, but I'm on Governor 4 with this. And I have this feeling that I'm going to be this cranky old man in front of Penn Station in the not-too-distant future. You Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, but, you know, look, our elected officials move on, and we just need to know that we haven't, you know, killed the idea to do what is actually quite a practical thing. And we know that the garden at some point is going to uh, want to move. You yep, led yep. the fight uh, along with Board 5 in terms of the, 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 the term limitation and, and the borough president. So if we know the garden is going to move at some point, we know the garden is going to want to move at some point, what are the places the garden can go? Right. And, you know, the back of Farley, to me, is still the best bet. It's an empty you know, it's empty. Um, it's not obvious that there's a lot of people who are dying to be office uh, tenants in the back of Farley. There are other locations, yeah. but I think that t to me is the point to focus on right now: is what do we make sure, what do we make sure we do to make sure that this does not get precluded? Yeah, I mean, I um, I, I think the the moving the back of Farley would be great personally, um, but. I'm sure there are, there are financial and other reasons why that's complicated, quite apart from uh, the way the Dolans see this. Um, mm -hmm. But since, Tom, you raised these other issues about the Port Authority, and you were looking yeah. at a map of a potentially very radically re-altered uh, landscape on the west side. Yeah. And I think, Vishan, you would agree with this, that while... Farley as a place to put the garden is a, is a good idea, or hypothetically a good idea. The larger issue is moving the garden, not that it go into Farley, so that if there's another site for the garden that could involve, right. for instance, the moving parts of the Port Authority. Right. Yes. yes. I, would would just, I would just remind everyone that the garden, along with the private interests here, spent an enormous amount of money on plans and engineering and so forth having to do with the garden in the back of Farley. Um, 
the garden, for I think very good reasons, has uh, a real uh, uh, affinity to the location. A lot of their patrons come on uh, commuter lines. A lot of their patrons come on the 8th Avenue line. So these things are very important. It's a very important private operating business. And, and right. so the thing is, you know, remember, Penn Central did this thing where they sold the land. Mm -hmm. Right? The garden owns the land. Yep. So they are going to need the incentive to move. Right? And so I, I just think that, yes, there could be other locations, and that's important, but it still strikes me that this empty building, at least the, the bottom, the, the back half of it is empty. There aren't a lot of obvious uses for the back of the building. You can't put a skyscraper there. It's a landmark, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why that makes Yo, sense to I move it 800 feet. Right, but if, right? again, to play devil's advocate, uh, the, uh, if that is a rental site, and the, they're looking to get rent from that site, and the Dolans own their land and are going to want to move for free, they're not going to go back there and agree to start paying rent. So uh, in the short term... Right, but that issue obtains no matter where they go. And the question is, if they are... Land so, you know, the garden's double block, right? So it's this huge piece of Manhattan. They're going to want to be in midtown Manhattan somewhere near transit. Right? And the thing is, if you go to, if, if you try to put them on a site that's completely sort of free and unfettered, and so you could develop anything on it, yeah. right, then the replacement value for that land is going to be much higher as opposed to the back of Farley where, you know, again, wh who, who are the takers? So right? how, how would that be financed? Um, I think this is, look, again, so, you know, back 10 years ago, a new garden in the back of Farley was like a billion dollars. And so call it a billion and a half today. Say the idea of recycling the building, and you know, our cost estimate came in at a billion. Call that a billion and a half. So it's a $3 billion enterprise, which is still less than what we spent on the two subway stations at the, uh, downtown, right? Um, there's air rights in play. There's the potential to do some sort of tax increment financing off the increased value of all the property, just as we've done at Hudson Yards. You know, there's a lot of latent value here, right, uh, that, that I think could be tapped in creative ways, but it's going to take government leadership. Yeah. No one can do this but government. We can all advocate, but only government can do it. If I can, I mean, like, I think Vishan's proposal pays for itself many times over just an increased um, value in the neighborhood. The complicating thing is that there's so many different pieces to this, and each of them has different partners. And for each piece of it to move forward, all of the partners have to see a win-win. Right. So where the bus terminal goes has to be something that New York State, New Jersey, through the Port Authority, and New York City all see as a kind of a, as an outcome they can live with. Moving the garden is going to have to be something that's going to have to be advantageous to Madison Square Garden also. This is not going to be something they get done with a of gun course. to their head. Um, Building, building Penn South is going to require the state. Gateway is now, of course, a federal project with New York and New Jersey and Amtrak working together on it. Building Gateway South, uh, Penn South, is going to require New York City, and the, and the air rights, of course, will require city involvement. So it's kind of the good news is that these projects are kind of modular and scalable and can connect together, but each of them has a different cast of characters, and there have to be a kind of series of bilateral agreements financial and otherwise, to make the whole thing worth. The danger, of course, is that it's very easy to imagine a future where we succeed with Moynihan Station. Good, we get that going. We build the Gateway Project because we've got to build it. We even build Penn South. Great, we got that going. Long Island Railroad Concourse doesn't do everything I want, but it kind of it gets widened some and it's marginally, it's a little bit better or something. That's all kind of nice. The danger is that if we don't address the issues Vashon raised at the end of the day, we're going to have all that stuff done. And then the garden is going to kind of raise their hand and say, we're now 75 years old right. and even more out of date, and we'd like to move somewhere. And there's going to be nowhere else for them to go because all of the sites will have been, the bus terminal will have been, say, let's say in that scenario, redeveloped on site. And they're going to be locked into an undesirable location for them in many ways, and there isn't going to be really that much they can do. And so... That's what I think, again, kind of fast-forwarding the conversation on the garden and making it part of these other pieces is really critical. Do, do we think that the fact that um, so much of the property around the garden is owned by Vornado, and Vornado and uh, Related are, again, 
um, the uh, developers of the Moynihan station. Um, now the head of Vornado is been named by our incoming president to be in charge of infrastructure for the, um, any, anybody have any uh, insights on Insights this? about what this portends? Well, I, well I'll, I'll say the one is they're, they're kind of circulating ideas. I mean, whether it's a trillion dollars or a half billion and whether it's new funding or tax incentives, there's, there's kind of clearly a priority on infrastructure and the, the incoming administration has said essentially the gateway is the top project. And they have a list of 50 national projects that they want to invest, and number one is Gateway. So we should, we should kind of expect that to go forward. But again, if anything, that to me means we got to think of the rest of these pieces too. Yeah, I was referring to the other pieces as well, of yeah. course, whether or not, I mean, they directly involve. You know, if you imagine this enormous rolling black thundercloud, and suddenly there's this thin little silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think the news that, that Steve was appointed to do this is probably the best news, at least I've had today. I mean, uh, he, you know, look, obviously he's the CEO of a private company. He's most focused on his shareholders as he should be. But I think he cares deeply about all this. I think he cares about not just his property, but the public interest here. And I, I think it's very good news. Well, we know that the, that though they've not made those plans public, we know that Vornado was spending an enormous amount of energy and effort and uh, time and money and uh, to try to think of ways to improve uh, Penn Station on that 33rd Street corridor and uh, in uh, on on 7th Avenue side as well. So he's personally interested in in doing that, both as you say for his shareholders and to make this a better place. So right. perhaps this, uh, now he's also obviously got a, big, a lot of interest on the backside as, as, as well too. Um, so I, we have some questions from you guys. All right, um, so it's getting late, so, excuse me. It's getting late, so we'll just do a couple of questions here. I'm gonna kind of combine a couple of them which are all kind of related. So it's a bit of a multi-part question that you guys can answer however you see fit. But basically, you know, what does success look like? And what I mean by that is, what is the timeline realistically? What are the important decisions to be made? Um, and I think most importantly probably is, uh, what can we all do here? And, and those of us you know, who are mere mortal citizens, what can we do to, to help this happen? I, I, these guys have a, a much more practical answers, but I, I, I just want to say, one of the reasons I said about the siloed nature of the conversation is I think we have to decide as citizens what the larger yeah. good is. And I think, you know, I was not um, really focused on uh, the first iteration of the um, Farley redo that you were involved with. Um, but as I look back, I say this as somebody who thinks um, a lot about and cares a lot about, um, you know, preserving important works of architecture. Um, I think we cannot allow ourselves to get bogged down in petty um, issues. And we, we need to come together around larger, um, around the larger good. So one thing I would say is thinking about that seriously. Uh, it doesn't mean, um, you know, it doesn't mean giving up what we value, but it, it means understanding that coalitions are built. We saw this in the election. You don't have coalitions of people who agree with each other 100%. Um, if you have, that's, if that's the goal, then you don't win. Um, so anyway, that's my little. That, that's, that's so that's, uplifting compared to what I was going to say. I mean, yeah. look, I'm an advocate. We look at kind of, you know, what is the schedule of the Gateway Project? It's kind of moving ahead very quickly up to essentially Ninth Avenue, which is good news that they're moving kind of quickly on the western portion of it, but keeping you know, an eye on how that goes and Moynihan in the short term. And then let's say kind of a half dozen years out, you've got east side access opening up and the gardens permit expiring again. So somewhere between kind of six months and six years is where, where this issue is going to get settled and these things are going to happen. Yeah. And, and so we got to make sure, as Vashon said earlier, that things don't happen in the short term that preclude the big ideas 
and that we try to move these things together so that the decisions that are made about the bus terminal are going to impact what happens uh, here. The decisions that get made about Gateway are going to impact what, what happens here. All of these things are going to be connected, and so kind of understanding when the decisions are going to be made. And, you know, this is why it's wonderful to be talking to a community board, because you folks are the, are the ground troops that really kind of work these things and push it. I saw it with the permit extension. We worked right. with you on it, but it was not until the community board really grabbed onto that that we had any currency. So let me piggyback on that. Um, and I, I, I think there's three things. One is, I think Gateway is enormously important, and I think the, the headwind around Gateway drives the issue of what happens at the station. Um, and I, I, for one, will not delink those two issues, right? And so I think that's something that we all should be focused on, that new train capacity into the station, hooray, new train capacity has new people in it, new people demands new passenger capacity. The capacity isn't about the trains. The trains are carrying people. It's about the people, right? Um, number two, um, there is, I believe, about seven years left on the uh, yeah. special permit, right? This is the perfect window of opportunity. I would argue, as an eternal optimist, that that is an alignment of the stars in terms of gateway. And, and this will take probably about seven years to do, meaning building a new garden in the back of Farley and building this would probably take that seven year period. That's not a crazy amount of time for the long term health and future of the city and the region. So, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, the time frame issue. And then the third thing is um, I live in Ward 5. I live in the south part of Ward 5. Um, I understand that there are going to be local issues. These are big decisions. Will truck, tra will truck traffic change? Will the way people who use the garden use your streets differently? Those are important and vital issues. I'm not trying to dismiss them at all. But uh, this goes to Michael's point. We have to kind of all come together and not let small parochial stuff get in the way of the big, larger questions here. And that means that those issues that are significant and are, are, um, are, are, are worth dealing with, we have to deal with them. And we should deal with them. But we shouldn't not deal with them by saying, well, we can't do anything, so let's throw up our hands and live with the status quo. Great, thank you. And um, a number of you, a number of people have asked about the through running, and it was touched on oh. in a couple of different ways. All oh, right, thank you. Eastside access. Oh. If you could just talk a little bit about more about that, I mean, we've got a couple different questions, but a lot of them revolved around connecting Penn to Grand Central, and Eastside access. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, so, 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 connecting Penn to Grand Central has been kind of an idea that's been around there for a long time. The truth is, there are real problems with the kind of engineering alignments and other things with that. Also. By trying to do that, you'd be giving up the capacity that you could get if instead you just go kind of east from, uh, from Penn Station. Again, as I, I kind of said, the alignment we're talking about, which is out to Sunnyside. I did have a, a, a I didn't go into to it in too much detail, but we are kind of thinking if you did that, you could build another stop somewhere to the east of Penn Station, maybe around Third Avenue or something, and you could, or you could think about a connection to the subways or other things like that, um, so that you'd be getting kind of New Jersey passengers where they want to go to the east without necessarily getting them to, to Grand Central. The real thing is that with the Long Island Railroad coming into Grand Central, you've kind of run out of capacity there. It's a very complicated alignment to try and make it work, and you wouldn't be getting the throughput at Penn Station that you're trying to get, um, uh, or the connectivity to Long Island uh, or points north and, 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 uh, and northeast. So, so really, as we've kind of looked at it, um, while there's always been this talk about could you connect Penn Station and Grand Central to each other, what you're doing instead, just to think about it, is you know you've got. Penn Station today, which has New Jersey Transit and Long Island Railroad coming into it, and Grand Central coming, Metro North coming into it. And people say, why can't you connect the two? What we're doing is better than that, because what we're talking about doing is that Grand Central will now have Metro North and Long Island Railroad via east side access. And by building the Penn Station to Sunnyside connection, 
You make Penn Station accessible to Metro North and Long Island Railroad and New Jersey Transit. So what you do is instead of connecting the two to each other, you better connect them to the rest of the region. And, and, and you do that much more efficiently and with more capacity. That's the basic argument. Great. Um, just really quickly, actually, um, we got a couple of questions on something that I wanted to, to get your comments on because I think, Vishan, it actually speaks to um, the importance of your proposal, which is basically where else can the garden go? And not saying that it's coming from here, but I think a lot of people are thinking, well, just put it somewhere else. And I don't, <laughs> not to answer for you, but I know that the lack of available sites is one of the, big, one of the biggest well, issues. First of all, I, I really think we have to disabuse ourselves of this notion of we're going to put it somewhere. They own their land. They own their arena. They have to want to move. Right. I mean, I see these ridiculous proposals about move them to Queens. Like, g give me a break. Right. It's not. It's not going to happen. Right. They own their land. Right. So, on top of that, as I said before, it is a double block site. Right. So you're talking about two, two blocks contiguous. Right. In the heart of Midtown Manhattan near transit. That's that's slim pickings. Um, so you know, what are the sites? Uh, there's the Morgan Postal Facility. That's further west. That's sort of deeper south. I know there are people who've had issues about that. But, you know, could the post office vacate that site someday, we suppose? Uh, if the Port Authority moved out of the Port Authority bus terminal, could they want to be at 42nd and 8th? Potentially. That's a lot of chess moves. Um, after that, <laughs> the, the list grows very, very thin. And again, I would go back to the thing that I said before, which is any site that you can move them to, that you can build skyscrapers on, is going to be very hard to make the finances work versus Farley, which again is a landmark and is a kind of empty warehouse in the back and you know doesn't have a lot of people jumping up and down ready to move in. So On top so, of train tracks, too, so you can't go. Yeah. Up. So let me just play devil's advocate again, say, OK, fine. So. Um, Let's move it to the back of Farley. Um, to do that, uh, someone's going to expect money up front. Mm -hmm. You talked about, you know, tips and and air rights and so forth. But somehow, somebody's going to have to produce money um, in the like billions of dollars, a couple of them. So I, I let me be a citizen who just thinks that you know, uh, essentially, what that is doing is saying somehow, public money is going to go, $2 billion of public money are going to go to give the Dolans uh, a new, brand new, spanking new arena at the back of Farley. Why should uh, the public citizens spend $2 billion to give the, government, the Dolans the money? The government has all sorts of bridge financing mechanism, like low interest loans that they can use to do things like this. And then they, get, they can get paid back a variety of different ways, air rights, tax revenue from the from the area there's a lot of different ways in which that can happen it's not that unusual things like this tom will tell you there are right. things things like this happen all the time and this seems like it's at the heart of what they're talking about in washington right now in terms mm -hmm. of how they want to do infrastructure so i i don't see that 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 that's so impossible to do but people want to do it obviously i'm saying it right. because i believe it because i yeah, believe right. that that is the kind of Right, the, the, but but I think right. I think what you have to say to the public, though, yeah. I mean, and again, you don't want to use scare tactics, but if you understand that the station's unsafe, it's unwelcoming, and it's like sticking a boulder in the heart of the neighborhood uh, to have the garden there right now, this seems like a very small price to pay to the, deal with those issues. They're also, I, I, I want to, you, you have to put it in the kind of larger context of the the growth that we've experienced and that we anticipate, and what will happen with or without these. There's a cost to not doing this, too. Um, mm -hmm. I right. believe that New Jersey's economy is lagging today, partially because the ARC project wasn't built 10 mm -hmm. years ago. That project would be coming online in 12 to 24 months if it hadn't been killed by Governor Christie. And the truth is, commuting from New Jersey to New York City has gotten worse over the last 10 years with the congestion and more delays and the kind of problems with the system. And if you talk to folks in economic development in New Jersey right now, they will tell you that home prices are down, that job growth is down, that tax revenues are down in New Jersey, precisely because that connection mm -hmm. to New York City and the growing economy there has become so tenuous. Mm -hmm. So it's already 
hurting the economy of New Jersey. And that's by not creating the capacity for growth in this area. We will start to kind of experience that more on a regional side. The flip of it is that we have very high confidence that if we build the capacity, if we allow for this, the growth will come. And that is the financing mechanism. There are roughly, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's something like 50 million trips a year currently under the Hudson River. Putting a dollar, two dollars, three dollars surcharge on, uh, on people to do that generates a lot of money. And if you double that to 100 million a year, you're starting to talk about the financing of billions of dollars. I just want to add to that, by the way, that I think both Senator Booker's staff and Ambassador Murphy's staff are waking up to the fact that Farley does little to nothing for New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And yet they are being asked to pay for some very significant portion of Gateway. Right. Right. And so, you know, I think a reasonable political person in New Jersey could ask, why are we putting up that kind of money if we have to come into the same crappy station and, and all of our people then have to transfer to the subway, unlike the people from Connecticut and Westchester? Right. I don't think that's an unreasonable question. Yep. And so and these are, you know, to Tom's benefit, Gateway was barely a dream when Ark was killed. And now all of a sudden we are, you know, this is extraordinary what's been done. And so that's twenty billion dollars. This is peanuts compared to what that is. This is a this is a rounding error, right? And so, you know, like if, if he can do that, he can do this. <laughs> In Tom we trust. <laughs> Um, all right, well, we got a, a number of really great questions, but unfortunately we're pressed for time, so we're going to have to stop the questions there. I want to thank you, everyone, for taking the time to write them down. Um, we're joined tonight uh, by our borough president, Gail Brewer, who's going to come up now and make a few closing remarks. Great. Gail? Thank you very much. I can't imagine three more dedicated, intelligent, uh, committed people to the city of New York than these three individuals. Com congratulations, Community Board Five, for bringing them to the forum tonight. So I, what I always think that when I was in the city council, I remember, and you might enjoy this uh, discussion, that uh, Christine Quinn was running for mayor and the uh, folks at Barclay and at the stadium in the Bronx were all like, they all had to pay taxes. And what the hell was wrong with the Dolans? Why didn't they have to pay taxes? And the lobbyists and the discussion was so intense, you could hardly even walk out of the council room without it happening. So I remember voting for this 10-year tax. They're going to have to decide what they're going to do in 10 years. We're not going to do it now. And I just think of the lobbyists in the council uh, right off of the uh, committee room, like accosting me on this issue. And here we are when we got, I think only six years to go, and we're going to build your discussion, your, your idea, Bashan, has to happen. Um, I say all of this because the uh, bus station was something that as borough president we spent some time on. And again, things change. We had a meeting with community board four, maybe board five was there. The uh, plan was to tear down, I don't know, 30 buildings in the heart of the historic district of Hell's Kitchen. And, you know, you see these buildings coming down in the slide, and you're like, that's the oldest meat market in New York. That's the 100-year-old church. And that got people going, and to the credit of the Port Authority, the governors, and the two states, we now have at least a thought that, uh-oh, bus station, gateway, Penn Station, Farley, Oh, we should think about how people get across the river. This is a bigger issue. Don't be silo, what we were told over and over again. And certainly the people who spoke here today and the community board were part of that discussion. So I say all that because we've got, you know, we've got a new infrastructure uh, discussion going on. Luckily, a, a New Yorker who's perhaps head of it. And we have, I think, the governor who does want to build, wants to make infrastructure his um, legacy item, and we have a city that is growing. I mean, to me, what you said about the economic development is what needs to drive it. Over and over again, we know there are going to be more people crossing the river in the future than there are today. This is not a number that's going to shrink. So we have to, you know, we have to weigh the cost. We have to think about the future. But I think that as the uh, discussion continues, just like the bus station 
change dramatically, that this can uh, change the, the, the way in which we think about it. Looking, at, if we just take this picture that you see up here and plaster it all over New York, as opposed to the one that shows the um, fake ceiling and fake sky exposure, that would be an example of how to do some of the discussion that would change people's minds. So I'm just here to say thank you. I've heard this uh, uh, back and forth a couple of times from the wonderful presenters that you heard here today. And I have to say, as the Manhattan Bar President, nothing could be more important. So I will try to do my part. The politics are very, very complicated. They're much more complicated than moving the damn thing. The politics are more complicated. But the fact is, when you have a good idea, you have to stick with it. So thank you for giving me this opportunity, and thank you all for being here. You really have perhaps the best discussion imaginable. People are out protesting. There's a whole lot going on in New York City tonight, but this is the best of all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gail. Can you, can you hear me? Thank you so much, Gail. Uh, thank you for, for coming. Thank you for our panelists who are incredible. Thank you guys for coming out. Thanks for everyone who's watching on the live stream. And have a good night. Thank you.